Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Beyond the Cage podcast presented by Fight Chicks. On this week's live show, Dave and I will be joined by Brad Walker of MMATorch.com, and we will go over some of the major headlines in mixed martial arts. And we will also pick the main card fights for UFC Fight Night 47 this weekend on Fox Sports 1. Once again, I'm your host, Jim Graham. Alongside me is The Juice, Dave Sadler. And how's it going, Dave? Good, 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 good. Had a good uh, weekend. Birthday was the other day. Uh, Monday, I think. Yeah, I'm old. Forgot already. Um, had a good time with Ray, um, Brad from MMA Torch, uh, Jake and Elizabeth from Fight Chicks. We all were at the XFO Outdoor War um, in Island Lake, Illinois. Uh, we met some friends, Jim, that we met at the Arnold. Such a small MMA world. Didn't think we'd ever see uh, these two again, but we ran in. I ran into Aaron and Amanda that we met out at the Arnold earlier this year. I was like, hey, don't I know you? They're like, yeah, you were at the Arnold. So now they're our Facebook friends. They're following the podcast, and hopefully they're watching. But, uh, hey, did you happen to check out that interview that I videotaped with uh, Brad and a certain hot topic in mixed martial arts. Yeah, we'll definitely have to mention that when Brad uh, Brad joins us. He's going to join us in progress here on the live show. But if you guys haven't seen already, and apparently everybody has because it's more views than any video we've had on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash beyondthecagepodcast, it's just simply Brad Walker talking with transgendered fighter Fallon Fox. And Dave, you're behind the camera. You're filming it. It's like a three-minute video and it already has over 3,200 views on her YouTube channel, uh, 20 comments or so. I think, uh, unfortunately, it has, I think, like 13 or 14 down votes, which <laughs> kind of stinks and only four up votes. But um, it's funny. If you look at Fallon Fox and kind of when she got into the headlines is when Matt Mitrione kind of ran his mouth about her and he got into a little bit of trouble. Uh, because of it, and that's really the last time most MMA fans had heard Fallon Fox pop up in any major news. So she was there around XFO, you know, taking in the fights just like everybody else. You know, Brad just asked her a few questions, and uh, we've gotten a lot of views on it. A lot of people, I guess, this is the <laughs> man. You know, when you hear controversial and polarizing figures, which I guess you can say Fallon Fox is, you know, you don't really notice it because it doesn't affect. You know, you or I usually, you know, on these types of situations, Dave. And then finally, I guess we're somewhat at the forefront of uh, controversy and drama, so to speak. And uh, it's rewarding us with over 3,200 YouTube views. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people were walking up to her and uh, shaking hands, taking pictures, the whole nine yards. So, hey, everybody's got an opinion, right? They all don't have to be the right one or the wrong one, but everyone's got one. So... Um, I the one thing out of and we can talk a little more uh, when Brad gets in here, but on Twitter, P, Brad laid out a couple names and she said she'd love to fight Misha Tate, and Misha responded, "No way, no how, never." And I think that's a I think that's a little ridiculous. If they figure out that Fallon can do whatever, if she were, I don't I don't think Fallon believes that. Um, she's at Misha Tate's level. She would just love to fight Misha Tate. It was the basic, it was what I understood videotaping the interview. But um, that seemed to gain a lot of traction. But uh, I'll tell you this much. If the UFC still wants to book that Gina Carano, Ronda Rousey, I don't think that's any more ridiculous than booking Misha Tate and Fallon Fox. Yeah, and it's not like she called out Misha or anything. She just said, oh, Misha's a, a good opponent. That would be a good fight for me. That's basically all she said. She's not bassing Misha Tate at all. And even Brad kind of was, uh, and he'll talk, he kind of egged her on by saying the thing with Caraway and, and whatnot, and she didn't even <laughs> respond to that. You know, she was just like, oh, I don't know nothing about that. You know, I just would like to fight her. So he even presented an opportunity to kind of bash her or whatever, and she didn't. So... You know, as far as I could tell, she seems to be a class act. So, yeah, uh, and speaking of comments, uh, we definitely do not, uh, what do they put, like, those are not the, 
express written consents of beyond the cage you know we'd uh, those are those people those comments are those people's not ours it has nothing to to do with us so uh, you know we, if you read just reading the comments are interesting in itself I've kind of enjoyed I get the email notification saying someone commented on your video and just seeing the back and forth between these people it's uh it's pretty interesting I'm kind of getting a kick out of it I'm, I'm just staying out of it I'm like you guys can talk whatever uh, they're not saying anything about you or I or Brad so as far as I could, you know, they they could say whatever they they want. I mean, this that's what people do on YouTube. Yeah, that's uh, hey, the juice on the forefront of uh controversy. But yeah, while you're on our YouTube channel, check out the other videos I did. Um, I got to catch up with Elizabeth from Fight Chicks, uh, talking about what they got coming up for Invicta and and all that, and uh, got to sit down. Do a little recap video with Ray Flores, and uh, of course he killed it as always. And that one has 44 views, so that's got like 10 million percent less than Fallon Fox. <laughs> Where's the justice? And I think our it shows like our lifetime channel views. I think the lifetime channel was somewhere between 13 and 14 thousand, and after all this Fallon Fox views, it's now over 17 thousand. That's just in lifetime views, so we might break uh, twenty five thousand here pretty shortly. Oh yeah. So uh, we're waiting on Brad Walker from MMA Torch to join us here, talking uh, headlines here in the first part of the show. So we'll we'll go on, and he's going to join us in progress. He's having some uh, technical difficulties on his end, but he's trying to join us here on uh, the Google Hangouts broadcast on YouTube. But let's stick with some. Uh, women's MMA news and that is the fact I don't think it's official yet Dave but it looks as though rumored that Gina Carano may not in fact be going to the UFC and taking on Ronda Rousey but she may be going to Bellator which of course Bellator is now run by Scott Coker and of course Gina Carano used to fight for Strike Force, which again was run by Scott Coker now more interesting, I think, than that day, because you see the similarities there, you know, with Coker and Carano, is the fact that Bellator has gotten rid of their women's division last year. So signing Carano would, in fact, mean they'd have to reopen the women's division, which I think Scott Coker has always been a firm believer in. So I guess that brings up uh, two issues here, Dave, and I'll present them to get your thoughts first before I give my comments. One is that... Um, is that do you think that's a good move by Carano going to Bellator rather than the UFC? Two, do you like the fact that Bellator will be bringing back a women's division? And I guess a, a quick part three: How huge would it be for Bellator to snake Carano away from the UFC? Um, I think this. I think that Bellator having a women's division is good. I think them having a 135-pound division would be an awful idea. I think them having a 115-pound division would be an awful idea. I think that the best thing that they could possibly do is open up that 145-pound division, and getting Carano would be a huge get for them. Um, Invicta is the number one women's promotion in the world, and their 35 and 15-pound classes don't really exist. Uh, the UFC's taken a lot of their talent to fill cards and all that kind of stuff. So I think it would be an awful decision on Bellator's part to make a 135-pound division. But they can definitely have the best 145-pound division, and bringing in Carano would be a good thing. And another point too, Jim, last night or early this morning I was watching Fox Sports Live and Ronda was on promoting uh, Expendables 3. Ironically, they said, what's, what's, your cha what's your next fight that you really want? And for the last two weeks or so, three weeks, month, whatever it's been, it's been all about, uh, you know, I want to fight Gina, I want to fight Holly, um, everybody but Kat. So last uh, this morning she goes, I want... I would love to fight Gina Carano. You know, I'd love to fight Holly once she's all healed up and ready to go. But, you know, I've had, you know, I've talked to Kat Zingano, and I promised her that I'd always give her the title shot that she earned. 
That's the first time in about a month that we've heard her say Cat deserves her shot and that she'd give her her shot. So with the way she talks like that, I wonder if, you know, maybe privately they've kind of given up on Gina Carano and she's aware of that. So now she's trying her best to uh, talk her way into her next title fight. Now, I think it would be good for Bellator to have a women's division, again, if it's done right. The first time around, Dave, the way Bellator was doing things, not really paying attention to it, it was not done right, and it made sense to let the division go because it was not being run correctly. But if Scott Coker can come in and do what he did at Strike Force, he might not be able to do it as successfully because, like you said, the UFC is taking a lot of the top female talent, whereas before, he pretty much had no competition in that arena. So it might be a little more difficult, but if he can pull Gina Carano and also rumored Marla's Kunin, that's two huge gets, two huge names, one of who uh, you know is still actively fighting, and Kunin, who's a top 10 pound-for-pound pound fighter in the world. So those would be two huge gets, and I think would draw some women, maybe not directly from the UFC, but eventually if they get cut, also some women from Evicta. You also look, uh, XFC has a women's division You know they can get people from. So it, it looks as though they can get some talent to feed for Bellator in that respect. Uh, two, I think for Carano... I think she maybe realizes that if she goes to the UFC, yeah, she's probably going to make more money, maybe get a little more attention, but she's also maybe going to take on, again, if she takes on Ronda Rousey, better competition and fighting in a weight class she's never fought before, whereas if she can go to Bellator, she can fight in her own weight class, kind of get comfortable, maybe have less pressure. And I think that's why on Carano's end it makes sense because you know she could take a couple fights in Bellator and then go to the UFC. There's no if that's what she really wants to do, return to fighting. Or maybe she's like, eh, maybe I'll fight once, you know, maybe twice a year, and I can do it in Bellator and just have fun and still do movies. You know, we don't really know what Gina Carano's at, so we'll kind of see there. And three, I think it would be absolutely huge if Bellator signs Gina Carano instead of the UFC, just because of the fact that the UFC has already come out and said, if Gina Carano signs, we're giving her a title shot. And then if Bellator comes in and signs her to a deal first, I think that's huge, and that already reaffirms Viacom's decision to out Bjorn Rebney and put in Scott Coker if he can make this happen. Absolutely. Did you, um, before we move on to the next one, did you happen to see that the, uh, I believe it's the matchmaker, that Kaplan, Sam Kaplan, isn't going to be kept on at Bellator? That doesn't surprise me because I think him and Bjorn were friends, so I think he was part of well, I shouldn't say he was a package deal when they fired Bjorn, but I think they want to make a clean sweep in the regime and the upper management. And I don't know if Scott Coker himself will be doing matchmaking or he'll be bringing somebody in. I'm not sure who his matchmaker was when he was at Strike Force. I have no idea. Um, but if I'm assuming that guy's not doing anything, or at least doing anything as major as making fights for Bellator. So I guarantee if Scott Coker gave him a call and said, hey, you want to book fights for Bellator? We probably join, you know. <laughs> right. I was. I'm glad you said that. I was just getting ready to ask who was Strike Force's booker. Because I know the um, the Sean Shelby was the WEC guy, and then the UFC kept him on to book some of the kind of the smaller weight classes, so that way Joe Silva didn't have to worry about booking, you know, 15 different weight classes. So I'm sure whoever was doing the Strike Force stuff is probably still around. Um, and they could probably get him. But I don't remember them really mentioning his name. It was really just Scott Coker they, they mentioned. So I'm sure for now, you know, Scott, there's probably some other people that are there that he kind of is using maybe as advisors for right now. And again, a lot of these Bellator cards have kind of already been set in place in terms of matches. So for this season, he probably hasn't had to make that many matchmaking decisions because a lot of stuff they already kind of scheduled, and they're they're really just kind of tweaking things more so than, than changing everything right away. Right. Well, let's move on to uh, our next headline, and that is UFC 178. It looks as though John Jones uh, had a bad ankle twist or break or fracture, sprain, however you want to say it. There's a lot of vernaculars you can use, and it doesn't look like his ankle would be good to go for UFC 178 in about six weeks or so. 
and he has been pulled from the main event against Daniel Cormier. It looks as though that fight, they're going to just delay it rather than have Cormier uh, stay on the card there in September. So it looks as though maybe the New Year's Eve card or, or card in January will have Jones and Cormier. At least that's the plan. So that leaves 178 without a main event, but it looks as though the flyweight title fight between Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson and Chris Kiriazal will shift in and become the new main event of UFC 178. And I believe we have Brad Walker from the MMA Torch joining us. Brad? Uh-oh. Brad? Brad's here. All right, we're waiting on audio and or video confirmation. He said hola. This is why we do live shows. That's right. Well, he's connected on the call. Just not nothing's coming through. I'm texting him. Can you hear us? Can you hear us, Brad? Or got a mic hooked up? Check, check, check. Sibilance. Ooh. He is in the call, but it's laggy. So we'll keep efforting that. Uh, All right. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure because I'm not getting any lag on my hmm. end. Well, I'll keep texting him and we'll effort that while we continue. All right. Well, uh, Brad should be joining us here shortly. But anyways, that looks to be the new main event of UFC uh, 178. And before we get to you know the injury pushing back the fight, Dave, um, uh, you actually texted me the news first because I was at work. You texted me, hey, you know, oh, there he is, Brad. No? No? Nothing? Nope. I saw him move. Oh, no. Oh, we lost Brad. All right, well... He'll um, be back. He'll be, he was connected there for a second. But one thing I brought up to you after hearing the news and then you're like, ah, it's probably going to move, move a shift, was how cool would it have been that they would have been able to keep Cormier on the card and we would have got to see Rumble Johnson move in and take on Daniel Cormier. And then you could have a true number one uh, contenders match as uh, Brad Walker joins us. Brad, can you hear us? This is the worst intro ever for a guest. <laughs> I'm trying my best. Um, so I guess, Dave, go off the, the, the Rumble Johnson thing I was thinking. I, again, it doesn't look like it's going to happen, but I think that would have been that would have been spectacular. Yeah, absolutely. It would have been a good fight. Um, I do like the fact, um, you know, Rumble Johnson is definitely somebody who could step in and fight Cormier. Um and that would be a great fight, but I think that the UFC is kind of it was kind of happy with all the shenanigans that went on with Cormier and uh, with Jones. So there was no way they were going to let that cash cow sit there. And now they're going to put this on that New Year's Eve or that that New Year's card where there's going to be all eyes on it. So chances are you're going to have Jones Cormier. Rousey wants to be on that card. Um, I think. Did Weidman is it is that the Weidman card too? I think they might be fighting earlier in December. I'm not I'm yeah. not sure if that's yeah, been right. plated. But, Again, this is all pending Vitor, you know, pass all his tests and whatnot. Um in, Okay. Um but yeah. It there was no way they were gonna let that money miss out on that money. You know what I mean? Um, the interesting thing is that they moved Kerry Azow and uh, Mighty Mouse to the main event of that card. 177 is a terrible pay-per-view now. That's the one that's Dillashaw Brow 2. The co-main of, of that fight is Tony Ferguson against Danny Castillo. And there's not really a big name on there. Betch Cohea and Shayna Baszler is on the main card of that pay-per-view. I would 
bet maybe something gets added to that. That's when is that card slated to take place? August thirtieth, two weeks. Mm, I guess that's pretty short notice to. <laughs> I didn't. I thought it was like a week before, a week or two before 177. I thought it was, you know, more in September on the date. So, you know, that's what they got to do. I guess it maybe would have been. Well, I guess either main event they would have moved, whether they moved the Dillashaw fight up or the flyweight title fight up. I mean, it. it you leave it kind of hanging with some of the other cards. You know, maybe they can move something up. From another, you know what I mean? I don't know. It would have been nice, like let's say they would have wouldn't have scheduled the Jacare Musasi fight for that fight night or whatever. Right. That would have been a perfect co-main event. Yeah. Well, yeah, and they're the main event a week later, so bummer. And they're not gonna but, now move that up because people are buying tickets for that fight night because of those two. You know, speaking of tickets, Jim. Interesting enough. The Jones Cormier fight was canceled. The UFC said that you can refund any tickets uh, up through the 22nd of August, wherever you purchase them. You could refund because of the change of the main event. It's pretty crazy, huh? Yeah, I think it's just because it's the the main event and the fact that they're still giving you a title fight. And I think they they realize a lot of people might have already brought because they knew it was Jones Cormier, and some may be disappointed that it's not. Uh, Jones Cormier and uh, Brad, can you hear us? Hello. He told me it's very laggy. Are you using an iPad? Okay, because if he's not using a, if he's using like an iPad or some type of mobile tablet device, that could be why it's laggy. Yeah, I'm not sure. He'll text me. I think he's just trying to effort it, and you know, we'll work through it. We're all we're all uh, we're all semi uh, intelligent. We'll figure it out. <laughs> um, what was I gonna tell you? Uh, yeah, I have to be the only person on the entire planet, Jim, that doesn't care that this fight got canceled on 178. Well, when you and I were going over the card, regardless of the main event, there were a lot of good fights on it. So, by you saying you know you you didn't really care, I was like, I wouldn't either. I mean, you still got you know Stephen Thompson and Patrick Cote. You know Brian Eversall's fighting, Katz and Gano's fighting. Um, you know, there's and now they're you know they're giving you a flyweight title fight. You get to see arguably pound for pound the best fighter in the world and Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. I mean, th that's still a very good card. It may not turn up in terms of pay-per-view buys, but there's a lot of good fights. Uh, Tim Kennedy's on that card, right? Dominic Cruz is on that. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's Conor still McGregor. it's still a very good card. And the, yeah, the Conor McGregor Poirier fight. So I mean, it's still a very good card, whether or not Jones and uh, Cormier fought on it. Yeah, I. It, to me, like people are like, yeah, but the flyweights don't sell. The only reason that people don't consider Mighty Mouse. Um, the number one pound for pound fighter in the world is because he's 125 pounds. It's really that simple. Is there anybody that's more technical, has more speed? I mean, when he gets a takedown, it looks like he's playing a video game. It looks that easy when he gets those. It's ridiculous, man. It's absolutely ridiculous. Well, let's move on to our next headline, and maybe our biggest headline here is former UFC and Bellator fighter, the man formerly known as John Coppenhaver, now known as the War Machine, he's in the news once again for beating his uh, ex-girlfriend who is in the adult film industry by the name of Christy Mack. Apparently, a couple nights ago, he went over to her house around, I think it, the report said 3 or 4 in the morning. She was, there. Yeah. she was there with another man. Reports have not confirmed or denied whether or not they were in anything sexual or romantic, but another man was there, and in that, War Machine got a little crazy. He not only uh, beat up this other man, who I guess was going to be traveling with Christy Mack on some type of tour or something, and then he severely beat up uh, the adult film star who has already posted uh, videos of her, well, videos, pictures of her from the hospital, uh, severely beat up and bruised. 
Uh, I guess she has a lot of missing teeth. I guess her hair was even cut by a knife. Uh, she has broken ribs, uh, a whole bunch of bruises all along her face and body. And obviously he's been cut from Bellator, and I guess he's on the run from the cops. He hasn't been caught from the police for this, uh, I guess it would be assault and battery, I guess it would be the charge. Maybe there would be something more to that. And... The interesting thing, Dave, is uh, one of the things you don't want to do, I guess, if you're on the run from the cops, not that I have been, but you probably don't want to put your tweets out there because I think they can track that or something. But he's been putting tweets out there, and he's put some very interesting tweets after the fact. And here's the fir these are the uh, big three that he's tweeted out after the event. His first one said, I'm not a bad guy. I went to surprise my girlfriend, help her set up her show, and give her an engagement ring, and ended up fighting for my life. The next, it's, that's followed by, the cops will never give me fair play, never believe me. Still deciding what to do, but at the end of the day, it's all just heartbreaking. Then the last one, I only wish that man hadn't been there and that Christy and I would be happily engaged. I don't know why I'm so cursed. One day, the truth will come out. And those are the three tweets, courtesy of John Coppenhaver's Twitter, at War Machine 170 And... I I even I've been talking with friends because it's gained you know crossover attention you know with domestic abuse and whatnot. I even had a friend of mine call me up while I was at home and is like, "Hey, are you watching HLN?" Not that I would be, but I was like, "No, why?" He goes, "There's a show called Doctor Drew on call, and for the last ten or fifteen minutes, he's going to talk about the War Machine with a panel of people." I was like, "Really? Well, okay." So I hit record. I was doing something else. I came back. I watched the last 15 minutes, and here, here they are talking about the war machine and domestic abuse. They even got Jenna Jameson on the call, who, of course, knows a lot about the MMA world and the adult uh, film world. You know, uh, She's been with Tito Ortiz and whatnot, so she knew John and, and actually knew Christy. She actually visited Christy in the hospital and you know, kind of got her opinions and thought on that. She thought it might have been you know, might have been uh, as a result of steroids or some other, uh, you know, performance-enhancing drugs that may have caused War Machine to go over the edge, maybe more so than usual. But he's always kind of been a, um, I don't want to use eccentric, but he, he's been prone to kind of, I guess, outbursts like this. And you kind of even saw that if you go all the way back to when he was on the Ultimate Fighter season six, he's always been the guy that maybe hasn't been quite stable. So with him doing this, it's not a complete shock. But I guess maybe to the level it happened uh, to Miss Christy Mack, it definitely is a uh, surprising and um, definitely probably his final act uh, uh, as a public figure. Because I don't think any organization can catch him after this uh, incident. Hey, Brad can probably hear us because I can hear me and you. No. Oh, said something. His mouth was moving, but nothing came up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is actually Brad Walker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was it coming through? He just can't hear. It's probably the feedback with the microphone. Can you hear me? Speakers. Yeah, we there we go. You. Okay. Do you have? Do you have anything? Or can you hear feedback or no? I don't hear any feedback, no. Okay. All, All right. right. should be good. All right. Once again, Brad Walker of MMA Torch is uh, joining us on the call. And, Brad, we were just picking up talking about the uh, the war machine uh, incident here with beating his ex-girlfriend, adult film star, uh, Christy Mack. Um, just, I guess, your thoughts on this and uh, what, what that maybe means for... Uh, you know, for maybe the rest of his career and just maybe the bigger issue of what it means, I guess, for the sport, regardless of, you know, high, you know, how high he, he's gotten, if, uh, what, what this means for the sport, maybe how people view it. Well, it, it follows the Brett Rogers aspect of, uh, I'm a big, burly guy trained to fight and I want to beat a woman. It's ridiculous and... I saw a tweet mentioned on, um, I think it was MMA Junkie, where his brother said he was in Canada, and Dog the Bounty Hunter can't there because he's a felon. Well, War Machine felon too, so how the hell would he get into Canada? <laughs> the guy's a douche. He should never fight again, and he should spend at least probably 20, 30 years in jail at this point. 
Yeah, the un- the unfortunate thing, I saw the same tweets too that um, you know, Dog and everybody associated with you know that with that show that they're on the hunt for him and that they're getting some uh, some people are kind of sending some clues into him and all that kind of stuff. The the ho- the unfortunate thing, the domestic abuse, all that stuff is awful. Um, I don't condone any of that kind of stuff. It's all 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 that stuff is terrible. But we're an MMA podcast, and the travesty in the whole thing, there's some idiot promoter that's going to pay War Machine to fight on their card. And there's... Don't talk about Ray Seffo like that. (laughs) I didn't say that. (laughs) But I'm saying some some local promoter is going to say, oh, I can put War Machine on a poster. You know, like... He should never be able to make money fighting again. No, and he he's already been to jail once for uh, assault and battery. That's how he got to prison the first time. So the fact that he's, I guess, a repeat offender, he's definitely going to jail another time. I would imagine increase in length. And you know, in his tweets, he say he said he was going over there to propose to Christy Mack, which I don't know how you go from going to propose to this girl to beating the living crap out of her. I, I just I just don't know how you, you go between those two parallels. It just seems crazy. Now again, I don't know what the man was this other man who was there, I don't know what he and Christy were doing at this time at four in the morning. Yes. But re- regardless, it still doesn't condone what your <laughs> intentions were of proposing to her, which to me seems odd. Hey, you know what? It's four in the morning. I should propose to Christy. She'll be up, right? I'll go over there. And then it, it's, a, it's a really weird circumstances, and he says the cops will never believe me. Well, that's because it's unbelievable because no one goes to propose to their girlfriend at four in the morning. It just... You, well, I've never proposed. Maybe Dave can attest to this. I'm pretty sure you didn't do it at four in the morning. So, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it just all seems uh, hard to believe, and you know, there's proof out there that he did this to her, so there, there's no denying that. Yeah. Well, uh, haven't uh, Tito Ortiz and Jenna Jameson proven that porn stars and MMA fighters don't mix in the slightest bit already? And as for the proposal, I proposed to my wife at like 4 o'clock in the fucking afternoon. Who, who goes at 4 o'clock in the morning? He doesn't even have a ring. Come on now. What a yeah. fucking liar. <laughs> if um, you know how Jim, you said that they were on two extremes, you know, going to propose and then beating her up. You know, if he had that kind of um, mean streak, he probably could have been more successful as an MMA fighter. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it, yeah, it's it's definitely uh an interesting situation and obviously you know he's not going to fight for Bellator and and the Dr. Drew thing that I saw they had Jenna Jameson on the call they ended up bringing her in but she was going a little bit off on a tangent she's like oh like uh, the the Bellator and the UFC they should come out and say something like you know that they can don't condone this and all that and they had some guy there I I thought he was a fighter I, I looked like Jeff Munson but I don't think it was and He's like, but Bellator cut him. What more can they do? And I was like, to me, the UFC sh- doesn't have to make a statement. They haven't been affiliated with this guy in years, so there's really no reason for them to come out and make Thank a statement. God. And, yeah, I don't even think there's a reason for Bellator to make a statement. I mean, they got rid of him. He's no longer part of their organization. That, to me, is as much of a statement as they can really make. Because, I mean, what are they going to come out and say? A nice handwritten press release typed up by one of their PR people saying, we do not condone the actions of War Machine and any domestic abuse. That's what they're going to say. What, what else are they going to say? It's not going to help anybody in this situation. It's not going to help Christy Mack get healed up from all her injuries. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So, it, well, I, I, uh, you know. I think that... Oh, go ahead, Brad. There's got to be somebody somewhere in the MMA community who uh, at least makes a statement saying, you know, a lot of the fighters have anger issues, and they like to, for some reason, you know, it, it's a track record now of the violence against the wife, or you know, pretend wife or porn star wife, whatever the hell it is. But 
I think these guys all need anger management classes. Just look at, you can't have a press conference anymore with a, with a fight breaking out. I know, you know, oh, I want the bell, I want my paycheck. That's great. But at the end of the day, you have to conduct yourself as a professional because your hands are deadly weapons when you're trained in that kind of sport. And War Machine has just proven time and time again he's like a five-year-old who lost his cookie. Fat yeah, kids he, understood that joke. No, no, yeah. Uh, he, he definitely is not acting uh, like a mature individual. And like I said, you go all the way back to his time on Ultimate Fighter. He's never been a guy that has been completely right in his mind. And you add in what may be steroids or any other performance-enhancing drugs, which could alter already alter his altered state of mind. You know, you, you know, you maybe even add an alcohol. There could have been alcohol involved in, as too. Again, we're talking about at four in the morning. It's not surprising if he had a couple drinks in him as well. So, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate situation, and it's hopefully is uh, something that can hopefully get resolved quickly. Like you said, I don't know if he is in Canada. I don't think he is. That's probably false. He's probably still in California, hiding out at someone's house. I, I, I don't think War Machine's that smart that he's escaping into Canada. Um, so, so uh, yeah, I think he will be apprehended eventually, and you know he'll he'll get his uh, his his day in court and probably sent off to back to prison. You know where he could hide and nobody would find him. Where's that? In the main event. <laughs> oh man! All right. Oh my god! Wow. A good one, Dave. Uh, <laughs> hey, let's oh, man. let's let's get uh, let's talk to Brad about his video because he didn't get to hear us talk about his video. Yeah, Mister Thirty Two Hundred Hits. Yeah, so uh, we kind of introduced uh, Brad when we, were, when we were having you on. We're like, yeah, you know, you did the video with Fallon Fox. You know, you just simply kind of run up to her, talk, ask her a few questions, and you know, she hadn't really been in the news a whole lot, and so. You know, when we put up the video, Dave and I thought, you know, we're going to get views, obviously, but it's now the number one YouTube video on the Beyond the Cage uh, podcast channel with over 3,200 views. Um, it has the most, I think it has the second most likes with four. It has the most down votes with, like, 15, so there's that. And it has uh, uh, 20 oh, comments haters. as well. Yeah, a lot of haters on the video, too, but... Um, Dave and I are we were just amazed at how many people have have taken this in and you know uh, maybe there's some of the opinions maybe uh, maybe not politically correct but we're we're glad to get the views and it was awesome we were able to uh, get that interview for us and put it up on the channel. Um, the video, I mean, for short, I mean Fallon Fox is a friend of mine, so the non PC people usually you know get a whipping for me on Twitter and all that crap. I mean, the the day after that video was uploaded, I know Dave saw a lot of it. Was a uh, like Twitter broke. My notifications were coming in so fast. My wife just wanted to stab me in the back. But <laughs> you know, Fallon, it, it, she's she's a nice lady. She she's a friend, and it, it wasn't just you know she's you know I'm gonna go call out Misha Tate. We asked her the question, who in the UFC would you like to fight? And it seems like everybody got a complex afterwards about, oh, no, she can't fight Misha Tate. She used to be a guy. Oh, well, get the fuck up. Used to be a guy. I'm pretty sure Chris Cyborg used to be a guy, and she fights women. <laughs> and you, you look at the state of the UFC right now, there's, there's not a lot of incredibly popular women in it. You've got Ronda Rousey, Misha Tate, Katz and Ghana. On that, there's not a real fan base for any of the fighters, but Fallon Fox carries this epic lesbian, uh, gay, bisexual base that would probably sell more pay-per-views than Anderson Silva on one leg beating somebody with a crutch. And as much as I love Anderson Silva, I just I think Fallon Fox is new, newsworthy noteworthy and she, she she's a ratings magnet she's already in the game I, it, it, it was a fun interview and you know I can pull an interview with Fallon in 10 minutes by hitting her up but you know it, it wasn't a, supposed to stir controversy like if she had answered my question about taking Brian Kerr away hell he you know that's some controversy but yeah yeah Misha that's what Tate, we I, said, I don't like, know if Misha Tate yeah. can actually beat Fallon 
Like, yeah, and we even threw that out there, Brad. We were yeah. when we were introduced in the video, we we're like, you know, you even kind of was trying to get her to spark a little controversy by asking the caraway question, and we're like, she was a class act, and and you know, said, no, I don't know nothing about that, and you know, just all she said was, I simply would like to fight her, and didn't call her out and said, oh, I'm gonna beat your ass, Misha, and I want you right now, right here in the parking lot of XFO Outdoor War 10. You know, it was nothing like that. You know, <laughs> very calm, very reserved, very respectful, and. I, yeah, uh, that definitely kind of took off, and the views took off. And you know, like you said, uh, you know, maybe with Bellator open up a women's division, you know, maybe Shannon Knapp somehow saw the video. Maybe she gets Invicta. You know, if she can start, you know, getting into a bigger organization, people can kind of see whether or not she's for real. And that's to me the only true test of whether or not you know people have this controversy. Should should she or should she not be fighting women? Well, if she takes on some for real competition on a big stage, we'll find out. That's the only way we'll know. But if she's fighting, you know, uh, you know, local professional uh, women, it's going to be harder to find that answer because so far she's passed the test on all accounts in whatever state she's fought in. Yep. That's that's true, and the, a lot of people still call out the science fact about Fallon, but the truth is, scientifically, she's actually below the average female. So. You put Misha Tate in a cage with her, Misha Tate has a scientific advantage. There's no bone density, there's no testosterone there. So there's a lot of misconceptions, but I I would love to see that fight personally. I, I, I call Misha one of my friends too, which I know he's the living shit out of Dave over there. He's a Mrs. I'm not Gano gonna... Jr. Hey, but... hey, this is, this is what I think about this. Listen, everybody be quiet. This is what I think. I right, continue crickets. with your point, Brad, before you're interrupted by those crickets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those damn restless legs having crickets. Yeah. I think Fallon Fox deserves a UFC shot. Dana White's a guy who understands fighters come from different places. I mean, I could riddle off a list of UFC fighters I would suspect are closetly gay, and I'm not going to hold it against them. I don't give a shit. My sister's a lesbian, and I think it's cool. Congrats. You get more women than I ever will. <laughs> but MMA is a sport that needs to become more accepting and understanding of what the world is now, and they need to stop hiring jackasses like Brett Rogers and War Machine and all these other guys who do horrible shit to people. Don't forget about Melvin Gillard and still wind still like up cocaine. making. Don't forget about Melvin Gillard and still like cocaine. You know, he so. he actually sent me a package of cocaine once, and I forgot the next week. So I mean, yeah, That's the truth. there's no level. So there's a lot of examples of that. So I mean, yeah, if some a lot of people have gotten uh, second shots and whatnot, but like I said, if she, if she can get a shot on one of on one of these uh, big organizations, you know, we can really see, and not not just we, but everyone can see whether or not uh, she is for real, and then. Maybe some of the controversy and, and everything will die down. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll, we'll know. I think there, when when something's different, I think there's always going to be haters. And I think regardless of how well she does or how poorly she does in the future, um, there's always going to be, I think, uh, some negativity around it, which is unfortunate. But uh, let's get into UFC Fight Night 47. Uh, finally, another UFC fight. I mean, it's been three weeks since the last one, so that's ridiculously long uh, for the UFC these days and breaks in their fights. And uh, it will be, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, this is the first ever UFC fight in Bangor, Maine, in the state of Maine. I didn't even know you could physically visit Maine. Didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's Banger, by the way. <laughs> Oh, all right. Um, anyways, the first UFC fight made, and yes, you can get to it, Dave, uh, by car. I don't think you have to take a ferry or anything to get there. Um, <laughs> but six fights will be shown on the main card for Fox Sports. One uh, looks to be a solid card. The first fight uh, of the evening will be at 145 pounds as Tiago Tavares will take on Robbie Peralta. Tiago Tavares, a veteran of the sport and of UFC, 18-5-1 in his career. And he's going to be taking on kind of one of the young guns here in this uh, 145 division in Robbie Problems Peralta, who is just a very dangerous striker, 13 knockouts of his 18 career victories, only four losses. He also has a uh, no contest. And so far, 
in the UFC, uh, Mr. Peralta already has four victories in the UFC, just one loss. And he also has a uh, no contest. Tavares has been fighting a very long time in the UFC, but most recently he has won three out of his last four fights, but has not fought since November of last year. So it's been a while for uh, Mr. Tavares. And interesting to see him moving down to 145. He's spent the majority of his career at 155. So that'll be interesting to see him in a new weight class, but... I think the the story is pretty simple for this one. We know that Tavares is a very good jiu-jitsu guy. He has 12 career submissions victories. He probably is the better grappler than Peralta. So if he can turn this into a jiu-jitsu match, I see no reason that Tavares can't go out there and submit him. But if it stays standing and it goes longer because of the weight cut, you definitely got to favor the striking and the power of the hands of uh, Robbie Peralta in this one, Dave. Yeah, um, I think... I, I, I think that's pretty accurate, Jim. Um, I think this is a good fight to start the uh, to start the night off, obviously. And um, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to break it down. <laughs> it's pretty much what I had written down on how I was going to break it down too. But um, you know, uh, th this is this is this card. Looking at these fights, this is why I like the number of fights that the UFC is doing. Because on a normal, if this was the old UFC, this fight gets buried on the undercard. This is going to be an entertaining fight at featherweight. And if they didn't have all these shows, I don't think a fight like this gets highlighted. So I'm happy that this fight's on the card. And, uh, yeah, it's a good breakdown, Jim. You uh, covered all my notes. So that's strong work. Hey, before we get Brad's thoughts... Just wanted to throw it out there. The the four fights that are on the prelims, they're on Fox Sports too. I think they're worth watching, Jim. The the flyweights, Juicier Formiga's fighting Zach McCoskey. I think that's a very important fight at the flyweight division. Uh, Sarah McMahon's fighting Lauren Murphy, which is going to be a good fight. And a guy that we interviewed, Sam Alvey, is making his UFC debut against Tom Kong Watson. So I think it's a... Uh, a full night of fights that are worth watching. Uh, Brad, what were you thinking? I, I on, uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I agree with what Dave is saying, but I think the way the card was set up is by a blind man with darts. First of all, Sarah McMahon should not be on the prelim. She was just in a title fight that was did poorly, and Mikowski and Formigo will be the fight of the night. I guarantee that. Yeah. But, um... In the Tavares fight, I, I think Tiago's got pretty fantastic advantages. Peralta's a dangerous dude. He's fantastic in the cage. But if you asked me to pick a winner, I would say Tiago Tavares wins this by either a split decision or a pretty nasty submission. Nasty submission, huh? I'm a Tavares fan. I would not. Na right. I'm, I'm talking like a hip slicer, some messed up shit. <laughs> The uh, next fight of the evening will be in the heavyweight division as Sean Jordan will take on Jack May. Looking at Sean Jordan, he is 3-3 three and three in the UFC, currently riding a two-fight losing streak overall in his career, 15-6, and six, and of those 15 career victories, 11 knockouts. Looking at Jack May, also known as the outlaw, he has fought just once in the UFC, and he got knocked out by Derek Lewis back at UFC on Fox 11. And I have a feeling, Dave, the winner of this fight, not the winner, the loser of this fight probably gets cut from the organization. Um, that's my feeling, because if Jordan loses, that'll be three in a row, and I don't think he'll stick around. And if May loses, especially if he gets knocked out again, that's two straight you know, finished losses. I don't really see him sticking around. So I think this is a fight kind of for survival. And you got two guys who, you know, looking at Jack May, this guy's six eight. You know, uh, we got a really big and, and tall heavyweight. You know, his weight's a little more distributed. And then we got kind of more of the shorty, or shorter and stockier and powerful guy in uh, Sean Jordan, who's just six foot, and he's at 250. So we're going to see kind of a contrast in uh, height and body types. Both these guys are not short on power. You know, between them, 17 knockout victories. And uh, one of these two gentlemen will probably, probably be lying on the floor on the canvas. I don't expect it to go 15 minutes. And uh, this fight where, you know, we're going to see just two big dudes slinging it out. Yeah, uh, Sean Jordan, 
much like uh, Brad was saying on the last fight, I think Sean Jordan has a lot of distinct advantages in this fight. Um, he's still relatively new uh, to the sport. Um, you know, he was a football player, and then now he's turned into a, a pretty good heavyweight. And, you know, he is coming off a two-fight losing streak, but they brought him along, you know, kind of at the right um, – They've been bringing him on at the right clip, you know, not giving him super, super big names. But then they did give him Gabriel Gonzaga and Matt Mitrione, which I think were both better than Sean Jordan. But he knows what's on the line in this fight. And I think that we're going to see a very calculated Sean Jordan. And uh, I expect him to be rather devastating in this fight. And do you agree with my uh, testament there, Dave, that the loser probably gets cut, do you think that's probably going to happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, Brad, what were you thinking on the, the heavyweight matchup between May and Sean Jordan? I, I'm a big Sean Jordan fan. I think he showed a lot of presence in um, past bouts. He has the power, the skill, and everything else just to completely take apart a guy larger than him. I mean, you look at his skill set, he, he's basically a striker. So if May goes for the ground game, Jordan's in deep trouble. But if it's standing, Jordan's going to win this fight all day, and it's actually probably a more entertaining perspective fight than the main event. I think it's definitely, yeah, someone's going to get knocked out in this fight. I find it very hard to believe that these two gentlemen go the the distance and definitely has a, if they still did, you know, knock out and however they do their, if they still did the way the awards that they should be and did, uh, probably knock out the night would be awarded for this fight. But moving on to the next fight of the evening, it will be at 170 pounds as Seth Bozinski will take on Alan Jovoy. And looking at Seth Bozinski, 19-11 in his career, 10 of 19 victories by submission. Looking at his UFC tenure, he has five UFC victories, the three losses. His last fight was a loss to the returning Tiago Alves back at UFC on Fox 11. And looking at uh, Alan Joe Boy, or Joe Boyan, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Uh, of his nine career victories, six knockouts, he only has two losses to his credit. He will be making his UFC debut. He is coming from the RFA organization where he went three of four in wins, winning his last two fights. So he's getting uh, promoted, so to speak, to the big-time show and taking on Seth Bozinski, who is a pretty solid striker, you know, kind of a longer and lengthier guy at 170, standing 6'3". And I don't know a lot about uh, Alan Joboy. I think I've seen one of his fights. He prefers to stand. Uh, though he has uh, somewhat of a jiu-jitsu background. And I expect these two guys to go stand and bang. And this is a fight where I think it either could be kind of boring, neither guy really separates themselves or does something to kind of stand out in this fight or really do something crazy, or it's going to be really good. Uh, I think it's really going to go one or two ways. I'm not really sure how this fight's going to go because I liked Kaczynski's last fight against Tiago Alves, but you know, a different qu caliber of an opponent. We'll see how he can uh, react to it. Hey, um, I'm not in the business of picking against guys who seem to show up from the RFA. So um, even though I don't know much about Mr. Joe Buen, uh I'm going to side with him. Even though I feel like I should be siding uh, with Basinski, these guys that they keep bringing up from the RFA um, seem to always show that they're, uh, they're very game. So, uh, yeah, that's my breakdown on the fight. <laughs> That's about the most logical breakdown possible, too. <laughs> I mean, Brzezinski's not, you know, a, a really huge marketable name, and Jabwe coming out of our... I mean, RFA has a lot of talent, obviously, with um, Ed Suarez being the guy picking most of the talent that goes in there. But I, I've got plenty of friends fighting for RFA, and I know they have a deep roster. So if he made it to the UFC, he's doing something right. So I'm going to side with your boy. Um, you know, Jim and Brad, let me get your thoughts on this. 
earlier Brad mentioned something about a blind man put this card together. Is it interesting that this is on the main card? Or does anybody know what this was supposed to be? Who was Bazinski supposed to fight? Does anybody know that? I don't know if it's any type of injury replacement or if this was the original book matchup, but yeah, compared to you know Sarah McMahon and Makovsky and Formiga, this is this is kind of the the oddball. All the other fights on this main card, you can make some sense out of, and you can go, all right, that's a main card worthy right. fight. But this one's kind of the oddball, and I maybe they're ba like I said, his last fight against Tiago Alves was really good, but you got a guy like Tiago Alves, regardless of his return you know, to the sport or not, it was probably going to be entertaining because Tiago Alves is almost never not entertaining. So I guess that maybe impressed some of the people at the UFC, and that's why he's being rewarded with the main uh, main card slot. That's the only thing I could think of. Well, I, I personally, I think if you take uh, the Formiga and McMahon fights and drop them above the Boach, Tavares fight and knock Jordan and May and Peralta and Tavares down to the undercard, you got a better card. I, I can't watch Fox Sports 2 anyway. Comcast hates me, so, yeah. <laughs> hey, Brad, you know who doesn't hate you? Yo, mama? The guys at Fight Chicks. Look at my new Fight Chicks shirt. <laughs> what? Or the folks at I'm a Beast. They love me. Oh, oh man. maybe you didn't see my hat. Oh, 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 MMA thing, very nice. Or maybe you didn't see my shirt. <laughs> or my banner. Maybe you didn't see that. Huh? 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 <laughs> Don't make me run across the room and grab my Misha Tate picture. I will just I will... that in front of the camera. The That's, That's fine. fine. I know where the X button is and up here in the corner. <laughs> look, at, look, I'm like Mr. Perfect. Check me out. I'm like Mr. Perfect. See me throw my shirt away? <laughs> Very nice. Very uh, nice. By a, way, by a way, I meant I handed it gently to my wife and asked right. her to hang it back up. All right. Well, let's get to the next <laughs> of the evening at 185 pounds as Brad Tavares will take on Tim Bosch. Brad Tavares is 7-2 and two in the UFC. His last fight broke a five-fight winning streak when he lost to Yellow Romero back at UFC on Fox 11. Of his 12 career victories, he has six decision victories. He'll be taking on the, Barbo Bar Bar <laughs> the barbarian Tim Bosch. Uh, of his 17 career victories, seven are by knockout. Hard times for Bosch as he has lost three out of his last four fights, including his very last fight against Luke Rockhold at UFC 172, and since uh, dropping down to 185 pounds, he is 5-3 and three in the UFC. And this is a fight, I guess, for two guys trying to stay relevant in, I guess, what the UFC is calling their top 15. You know, two guys that are trying to be relevant in the title competition and still be contenders. Now, for Bosch, it looks as though he's kind of on his way out and towards the downside of his career. I, I don't... I mean, he could probably beat Brad Tavares, but I don't really see him making a comeback you know, being relevant once again in this division like he was a couple of years ago. And for Tavares, you know, he's a young guy that definitely has the frame for 185. He's still young. He's tall, lanky, very good technical kickboxer. You know, still has to work on the grappling game a little bit. That's probably his area of weakness, and that kind of plays in the Bosch's forte a little bit there, being a former collegiate wrestler. So for Bosch, I look to look for him to push the pace, try to get in the clinch, and try to be up Tavares that way. Because I think if they stand under that range... Tavares is just way too technical and way way better of a kickboxer for Bosch to try to go in there and, and mix it up. So uh, that's why I look for uh, seeing in, the, in this fight. Brad, I will give the floor to you, and then I will clean it up at the end. Oh, so I'm going to make a mess now. All right. Um, I, I'm not a Bosch fan. I, I in no way feel at this point he should be in the UFC. I think we all know he really lost that fight to Hector Lombard. And he has just done nothing to impress me in seemingly forever. He's a one-dimensional guy. He can punch really hard, and he can gas out in the first round, and that is really where his entertainment ends. Tavares should be able to out-punch him, out-point him, probably take him down if he really needs to, and then laugh his way all the way to the bank when he gets his you know, win bonus and say, hey, Barbarians are dead for a reason. Ah, see what you did there. Yeah. 
Um, you know, to, to your point, Brad, Boach hasn't been exciting since UFC 144 back in February of 2012 when, like you said, he gassed out in the first and then came back to beat uh, Yushin Okami late in the third, or early in the third. And, uh, you know, like you said, most people, I would agree that I think he lost that fight to Lombard. Um, now, Tavares, like Jim mentioned, he, he looks like he fits at 185. He can be, he's not overly big. It doesn't look like he's going to, uh, cardio is ever really going to be an issue. But this is one of those where this is a victory. If Tavares can get the victory, this is a victory that can propel him into that top 15, into that next uh, that next step in his career. Because uh, I believe you mentioned it, Jim. Don't forget uh, Tavares. This is only his 15th professional fight. He's still young in the sport. So um, I guess I have to agree with Brad that I'm not much of a Boach fan. And uh, I'm always happy to see the young guys get in there. All right, let's get to the co-main event of the evening, which will be at 155 pounds as Ross Pearson will take on Gray Maynard. And looking at Ross Pearson, the man from England, he has a record in the UFC of 7-4 and four with a no contest. His last fight was a loss, a split decision loss, to Diego Sanchez. Uh, back in June of this year, and of his 15 career victories, he has five knockouts and five submissions. Uh, looking at Gray Maynard, tough times for Gray Maynard. He has only won one fight since 2011. That was against Clay Guida at UFC on Fox 4. Other than that, he has one draw and three losses coupled in his last couple of fights, and he has not fought since losing to Nate Diaz, getting knocked out in the first round back in November of last year. Of his 11 victories, nine are by decision, and he definitely took some time off trying to reassess himself in his career, and it doesn't look as though, you know, Gray Maynard, again, we, we mentioned maybe Tim Bosch being on the downside of his career. It looks like that's maybe where Gray Maynard is right now. I guess we'll find out on Saturday against Ross Pearson, but for Ross Pearson, he definitely obviously wants to keep this fight standing. I think he has the better technical boxing skills than Gray Maynard. Power, I would say they're maybe, maybe a bit even. Uh, maybe Pearson a little more just because he's a better boxer. Um, wrestling, obviously, that's Maynard's domain, and he can very easily take this fight to the ground and, and beat up Pearson that way. But... For He has to do it early, though, I think, for Maynard. I think he has to get to Pearson early because I think Pearson's a guy, once he sets into his rhythm in his boxing, he's a very hard guy to take out of it. And I think for Maynard, you got to disrupt that early because you don't want to stay standing uh, with Ross Pearson. And he's a guy that I think can knock out Gray Maynard. Um, to go back to that last fight where you didn't think um – Boach beat Lombard. I don't think that Diego Sanchez beat Ross Pearson. <laughs> I don't think anybody did. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, Ross Pearson, for lack of, uh, you know, I, I guess as media members, we can uh, – Ross Pearson's almost on a four-fight winning streak. That no contest against Melvin Gillard was kind of – uh, you know, that wasn't good. And then, you know, he won the Sanchez fight. But of these two, I think Maynard's more on the downside of his career. Um, I think Pearson still has some fight left in him. Um, I just hope Gray Maynard hasn't looked good in his last two fights. And if it's time for him to go, I want him to be time for him to go. Um, I don't want to see like a BJ Penn. Like you know, like what we saw at Tough 19 finale. I just want Gray Maynard, you know, lose a decision or get submitted early. But I just don't want to see a guy that was that talented go out um, looking awful. So I hope we don't see that. But um, I have a feeling that we just may. Not to be confused with Jack May. <laughs> Oh, man. 
man. That was filthy. Are right, your thoughts on the co-main event, Brad? I actually, I'm going to completely admittedly disagree with Dave here because it would be a job if I could. I, I think Maynard is going to go out there and wrestle Pearson down and beat the daylights out of him. I'm surprised Gallard didn't try to execute that tactic better, but, you know, that fight didn't end well. I mean, Maynard beat Guida, who's a very accomplished wrestler, but everyone beats Clay Guida these days. So I, I got to take Maynard to probably knock him out on the ground. Ross Pearson doesn't have a very well-rounded ground game. Hey, Jim, before we get to the main event, and it's a live show, and it's a live show. Let's get Brad's opinion. Clay just fought. You've seen Clay fought, fight all over the place, Brad. Jim mentioned, and I tended to agree with him, so let's get your thoughts. Do you think Clay has begun the downward, uh, the downward part of his career? Oh, he, he started that as soon as he got into the UFC. <laughs> oh, come on. I mean, I, I I know a lot of fighters who train with Clay. I've met Clay. He's a nice guy. But if he doesn't either learn some new skills or possibly drop out of the weight class, he's a really small guy. He's going to wind up with a record like his brother's. And it's just going to be devastating to see a dude fall that hard. So, yeah, Clay is definitely on his way out of the game. All right. All right, well, let's get to the main events of the evening. 205 pounds as Ryan Bader will take on Ovin St. Pru. Looking at Ryan Bader, 17 and 4 in his career, currently riding a two fight winning streak. His last fight, he beat Rafael Cavalcante at UFC 174. Of his 17 career victories, seven decisions. Looking at Ovin St. Pru, 16 5 in his career, seven of 16 victories by knockout. He is currently riding a five-fight winning streak. His only loss in uh, recent memory was all the way back in 2011 when he lost a unanimous decision to Gegard Mousasi. After that, he has not lost again since 2009, and he has looked really good of late, not only in strike force, but since moving over to the UFC 4-0 so far for the UFC. His last fight, he defeated Ryan Jimmo at UFC 174, submitting him in the second round. And even though both guys are the same age, have relatively the same amount of fights, this is the best guy Ovin St. Pru has fought uh, since Gegar Mousasi back all those uh, years ago. So it's been a while since you can say Ovin's has fought a top competitor in the division. And he's getting this test here with Ryan Bader, who's kind of been... Uh, a gatekeeper of sorts for the 205 division, always you know near the bottom of the top 10 in the UFC rankings and in most people's MMA rankings. And he's a guy that if you can beat Ryan Bader, chances are title shots uh, doesn't come doesn't doesn't have to wait too long afterwards. So if Ovin St. Peru can get by Ryan Bader, definitely a very bright, brave future ahead for him. And really, Bader's the more technical guy. He has the wrestling background. Um, he, he probably will push that game plan for Ovin St. Pru. It's not like he's an incredibly amazing striker or anything. I think it's just the fact he's super long, he's lanky, he's athletic. He kind of does some unorthodox things that a lot of people have a hard time uh, seeing or preparing for, and that could give him an advantage uh, against Ryan Bader. And if he can stop the takedown, keep it standing, I think that's his best option because I think getting into a wrestling match as powerful as he is and athletic he is he doesn't have that technical of a, a wrestling uh, background and I don't I don't think he really wants to uh, try that area but I guess the the one X factor for both gentlemen will be the power you know will the power of either gentleman affect the other and will that be a deciding factor whether this goes to a decision or ends up being a finish because I, I don't think Bader will will submit Ovin St. Peru. Maybe Ovin's can pull out a submission on his end. He's pulled out some crazy submissions here the last couple of fights, so if anyone's getting submitted, maybe it's Bader, but um, really a test to, you know, like I said, if Ovin's is for real and for Bader, just staying relevant in the 205 division. Jim, that's not the way that I see it. See what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I digress. 
Jim, you can laugh. It's a live show for crying out loud. No, I'm just gonna shake my head. <laughs> there are 242 other people who like our Facebook page besides us three. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I don't want to steal Jim's thunder because he mentioned this before we came on, but uh, he didn't say it just now. Ovin St. Peru was ranked number 10 in the UFC's ridiculously awful rankings. Who has he beat to become number 10? Uh, don't get me wrong. TJ Cook, John Villante, Cody Donovan, N N uh, Kyla Kryloff, Ryan Jimmo, those are all talented mixed martial artists. But beating those um, five people should not make you a top 10 fighter in the UFC. For crying out loud, look at Ryan Bader's eight and look at the names that he's beat. You know, like he beat Rampage Jackson. He beat Vladimir Matyushenko. I mean, he's fought big names at the time. And, uh, Tito. Well, he lost to Tito. <laughs> but uh, it, it's going to be a good fight. Does, is it main event worthy? I don't think so. Um, like Jim said, I think Ryan Bader is a little more technical and more aspects. Uh, would I be shocked with either person uh, walking out with a victory? Absolutely not. What were you Brad, thinking on the it, Brad? Um, well, I think Dave's glasses were kind of retarded there for a minute. Um, I've, I've got to say that I, I don't think either one of these guys belong anywhere near a top ten list, as Dave was a uh, nice eye patch. God, you drive me nuts. Um, I, a Bader is a gatekeeper for, I think, the top 15 at this point. He's not a fighter who you should beat and wind up fighting John Jones, because if you go from Bader to Jones, you're going to get killed. <laughs> Owen St. Proust is a talented guy. He, he's a fun fighter to watch. He was a lot of fun to watch in Strike Force, too. But as uh, Dave said, he hasn't beaten anyone who should put him in the elite category in the UFC, and the rankings are skewed, awful, and... Whoever's voting on them should be crying themselves to sleep for the fact that they're leaving out much more talented fighters. I, I'll take Bader to take a good win here. I think he's got the power to just catch St. Pru off guard, and if he doesn't, I'd be really surprised. You, you, you know, Jim, we've talked about it before, the rankings that you see put out, how awful they are. Currently, Open St. Peru is 10. Let's say he beats Ryan Bader, who is eight. These are the people above OSP. Real quick, I'll go through it. Shogun, Bader, Hendo, Phil Davis, Rumble Johnson, Glover Teixeira, Sugar Rashad Evans, Daniel Cormier, Alexander Gustafson, and John Jones. He can't win a round against any of those people. Maybe Hendo these days. Oh, maybe. But... Uh, I just I, I I think it's ridiculous. I mean, if he wins, they have to match him up against one of those people, and all of those people will steamroll OSP or Bader. <laughs> well, let's get to picks then uh, here for UFC Fight Night 47, and uh, I guess we'll you know we don't have our normal running music because it's a live show, um, but we'll just kind of go uh, one at a time here, given our picks. First fight of the night that was 145. Tavares and Peralta. I don't know. The fact that Tavares has never fought at 145 kind of is why I'm, I'm giving a little bit of pause. Because if this is at 155, it's Tavares all day with his jiu-jitsu. But you, know, you never know when you're cutting a new weight class. But I'm going to go with the young kid Peralta. I don't know why, but I'm going to go with him to pull an upset. I think he'll be able to outlast and, and get a knockout here. So I'll, I'll take Peralta. I'm going to go with problems for the victory. I'm going to go with Tavares. i, I got to pick against you two and say that even with the cut, he's going to hold the power and he's going to hold the ability. All right, heavyweight Sean Jordan against Jack May. 
Uh, I'm going to go with Sean Jordan, even though he's a little smaller. I think you know he's been training with those guys at Jackson Winkle John for a long time. I think he has a little more well-rounded game. He's not just simply a, a big brawling guy, which by all accounts that looks like what Jack May does. Uh, so I'm going to go with a little more technical guy. I'll take Sean Jordan. I am going to go with Sean Jordan as well. Uh, Jordan, all day. I, I would write a column about it for MMA Torch, the fact that Jack May has no chance in hell, but I, I don't want to write a column about a guy I've never heard of. <laughs> At 170, yeah, Seth Kaczynski against Alan Joboy or Joblon, however you, you say his name. Um, he probably has a shot because, you know, Kaczynski, even though he has more UFC experience and more fight experience, you know, he's not a, a world beater or anything. A little longer and lankier, but... Um, <sighs> I don't know. I, I, you can really go either way in this one. I don't think you're really wrong in picking it, but I'll go Bazenski just for the experience and, and, the, and the length. I think that might give uh, the newcomer to the UFC some problems. I should pick Bazinski, but I'm not. I'm going to pick Jobin. I, ooh, I'm, I'm going RFA all day. Jaboy. All right, at 185, Brad Tavares against Tim Bosch. I'm going Brad Tavares. Uh, he's a really likable guy. I think the guy has a bright future, and um, I think he's just more he's the more technical stand-up fighter, and I think he's going to stop the takedowns and, uh, and win. So I'll, I'll go with the Hawaiian in this one. Yeah, I think it's Brad Tavares as well, and uh, I think that's what Brad's going to say too. I just have a feeling. I got to admit, the guy's got a wonderful first name, so I'm going to take Brad Tavares. <laughs> <football name. laughs> All right, <laughs> the co main events of the evening: 155 pounds, Ross Pearson and Gray Maynard. I think I think it's, I th hope this is a good fight. I think it, ha it has some makings that could be a good fight. Um, Maynard definitely has the wrestling credentials. Um, that's what I, I think he'll push, but I maybe I think it'll be a little bit of an upset. But I'm going to go with Ross Pearson in this one. I'm going to go with the real deal. I. I, I hate to agree with you, but I'm going to agree with you again. And I'm going to pick Ross Pearson. I just think um, Gray Maynard's just on a – not having the best stretch right now, and I think Ross Pearson's going to be able to walk away with the victory. I, I, I disagree. First of all, the real deal is Joey deal. Thank you very much. I had to have the XFL plug in there. Um, I, I'm taking Gray Maynard. I think he's going to wrestle him down and beat the tar out of him. Joey the Real Deal just got a Joey shout out on the, on the cage. <laughs> wow. wow. All right, let's get to the main event. Ryan Bader against OSP Ovin St. Peru. Man, Ovens has been on a run, but it seems like if it's not a top-flight guy, Ryan Bader beats them. Uh, he's the Michael Bisbing of the 205 division. So I'm going to go with uh, Ryan Bader to win this one. Yeah, I'll take Darth for the victory. He's going to force choke the shit out of Ovin St. Peru. I, I got Darth Bader all day. Force. All right, uh, we got our picks in there. Yeah, uh, Brad, I said, uh, thanks for coming in. Do you have any other uh, shout-outs or uh, plugs you want to give before we end the broadcast here? Make sure you get to MMATorch.com, download the MMA Torch app, Watch Vigilante MMA and enjoy Beyond the Cage. I hope everyone's seen the Fallon Fox video because I love stirring the shit pot. <laughs> and uh, what's your Twitter? Everyone can uh, write you in and tell you how they uh, don't agree with Fallon Fox. <laughs> oh, that that's just fine. At Brad MMA Torch. All right, Brad. Uh, thanks for coming right. on. Uh, Juice. Any any final thoughts here? Um. Yeah, I do. I'm going to lay down the challenge. Brad, you need to set up a video camera near your TV and we'll make a little YouTube video of me destroying you in EA, UFC, <laughs> MMA, hey, live on the hey, Xbox I'm up 4-3 one. right now. I'm up 4-3. Yeah, well, you don't have any videographic proof of that. <laughs> I've got an iPhone. I can make it happen real quick. <laughs> As long as 3,000 people watch it, I don't care. <laughs> well, do I need to have Fallon Fox and Ray Flores do color commentary? That would be awesome. Anyway. That would rule my face. Oh, man. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks to Brad for coming on. Of course, the juice there at Vigilante Juice. I'm Jim Graham. You can follow me on Twitter at Jim Graham. we got to thank uh, our folks at VigilanteMA.com, MAInsider.net, MAForLife.ca, BluegrassMA.com, uh, the new and improved MMA-Freak.com. Of course, our uh, partners at MMA Signatures. Uh, USA.com, uh, our partners at Top Rated MMA, and of course our presenting sponsor of Fight Chicks is Dave showing off their Kat Zangano shirt there. So uh, thanks for everybody for watching. If you're uh, if you the video version, if you're watching on demand, you know you'll it'll be up shortly. If you're watching this live, and then of course uh, we love our people watching the uh, audio only version as well. So uh, for Brad Walker, for Dave Sadler, I am Jim Graham. Thank you for listening and watching the Beyond the Cage podcast presented by Fight Chicks.